Hello, welcome to World Civilizations Since 1500. Now this is uh, the second session of the first topic titled The Many Worlds of the Pre-Modern Era. And we're going to continue looking at economic systems. I mean, there's one more region to look at, and we already covered uh, in the first session uh, China, India. We covered uh, some parts of, of Africa as well. Um, we, we also covered uh, Egypt and, and Europe. And now we're going to be moving into Mesoamerica. We're going to look at that briefly and also look at the environmental impact uh, of those agricultural systems. And after we cover that, we're going to spend the rest of the session looking at social organization. All right, so let us now turn to our um, outline here. And as I said, uh, there's one more region we have to look at uh, in terms of looking at the economic systems of pre-modern societies. Um, and they're all uh, agriculturalist, uh, but they vary in the way that they uh, work the land, the uh, type of techniques they use to uh, irrigate their crops, you know, uh, the type of tools and so on. All of that varies, something that we covered quite extensively in, in the first session. Here in Mesoamerica, we're going to see a very unique uh, type of system uh, that was very distinct, very different from all the other systems we have discussed previously. Um, particularly, we're going to be looking at uh, a region of uh, the American continent that is known as Mesoamerica or Middle America, where by the 1400s there were two uh, civilizations that continued uh, thriving in this region. Uh, some of those civilizations uh, are older, of course, like the Maya, for example. The Maya go back thousands of years into the past. And the Aztecs of central Mexico, uh, they were really latecomers in the scene. Uh, they arrived around the... Uh, 1200s AD to uh, central Mexico, establish themselves there and build a, an empire. Uh, in central Mexico, you can see the, the region, the Maya area, uh, is in the Yucatan Peninsula and parts of Central America. And uh, the Aztec region is in central Mexico. They also, of course, are agriculturalists. Uh, the region of Mesoamerica for thousands of years build the societies there build their civilizations uh, from the domestication and mass production of three main crops and that is corn beans and squash okay corn beans and squash this is considered the uh, holy trinity of the uh, mesoamerican diet and really that was the also the holy trinity of the indigenous diet, if you will, of uh, all agriculturalist, uh, agricultural societies uh, scattered across the continent, okay? So uh, from North America all the way to South America, uh, agricultural societies were sustaining themselves through the production of corn, beans, and squash. And of course, there's a wide array of different uh, varieties of, of maize or corn uh, that they, they domesticated and produce over thousands of years. The same with beans and squash. Now, I mentioned that Mesoamerica and the American continent as a whole is going to be a very unique case study uh, because the geography of the American continent was very, very different from the rest of the world. And uh, here, agriculture was a little bit more difficult. Uh, due to the fact that, for example, uh, in the American continent, we don't find animal domestication as we see it elsewhere, like in Africa or in Europe and Middle East and Asia, for example. The animal species that all world societies, like the ones I mentioned, use for agricultural purposes like cattle and oxen, for example, and horses, uh, those animal species don't exist in the Americas. 
So there's only one minor exception in the American continent. In South America, the peoples of Peru, uh, the Incas, as they were known, uh, they were able to domesticate one animal species, and that was the llama. Again, and they used it for transportation purposes, uh, but not for agriculture. But everywhere else uh, around the Americas, we don't find animal domestication. So that type of uh, asset, again, is not there uh, to be used by uh, the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Uh, another constraint uh, of the geography that put a limitation on the economy as well is the fact that in the American continent, Iron ore was not easily available on the surface of the of the earth, as it was in Europe, for example, or in Asia, or in the Middle East, for that matter. So, here in the American continent, uh, the indigenous peoples never really entered the Iron Age. Uh, they did not produce iron works or iron tools like wheels, for example, or the plow. Again, the plow was instrumental in the old world for for, uh, for agriculture. So we don't find that as well, and that was also a limitation uh, in terms of uh, how much uh, production could take place every year. Uh, it was constricted by the geography. Okay? Uh, also in Mesoamerica, particularly in Mesoamerica, we find also the lack of major river systems like the ones that we saw, for example, like the Indus River Valley, for example, or the Nile, uh, or the Yangtze Yellow River in China. Uh, we're not going to find those major river systems. There were some, and some of them were used for irrigation purposes, for, but uh, for the Aztecs and the Mayas, we're going to see uh, an absence of rivers, and so with that, uh, there will be certain innovations uh, the Mayas and the Aztecs, each one of them innovated different ways, again, to uh, produce crops uh, other than river irrigation. Let's start with the Maya. Okay, so uh, first and foremost, uh, the Maya thrive on this region in uh, the Yucatan Peninsula, parts of what today is Guatemala, Belize, parts of Honduras, and El Salvador. Uh, now, it is precisely in this region where we find the absence of major rivers again. It's really an area that is covered with rainforest uh, for the most part. So there are seasonal rains. You know, this is you know, very predictable as well. Uh, from uh, May all the way to July. Again, what we find is the rain, rain season. And it's very predictable. This happens year by year by year by year. So again, of course... Uh, the timing for the planting cycle in agriculture uh, occurred around February or so uh, due to the fact that by uh, early May uh, the rains were going to come in and of course irrigate the fields and they produce of course a kind of natural form of uh, irrigation so to speak that was very very uh, cyclical seasonal and very predictable as well now there is, of course, uh, a certain challenge that the Maya faced uh, in this region, that is, that is the rainforest. Again, uh, there's a lack of uh, animals to be used for farming and for fertilization. Uh, and also, of course, the presence of a rainforest from which uh, the Mayas are about to build their grand cities, by the way, uh, over the span of about 1500 years or so, um, uh, let us just say, uh, starting about uh, 250 BC, um, all the way to uh, the year 1200 uh, AD, uh, the Mayas were really building a series of city-states or kingdoms, and they built over 50 of them, all scattered across this region. So uh, it was a very difficult uh, environment to work with and the way that the Mayas accomplished uh, 
overcoming this challenge is by, of course, cutting the forest and in doing so, making space for agricultural production. And they innovated a particular system, uh, otherwise known as the milpa system, uh, milpa or milpa, uh, in which uh, what this system does is that on the one hand, it allows for the production of multiple crops. Again, it's not just corn, beans and squash. They also added other vegetables, uh, tomatoes, for example, chilies, cocoa beans, and, and the like. It was a very, very complete uh, type of diet that they had. Um, so it's again, it's a multi-crop system. But in order to regenerate the soil, because again, they ran into the same problem that other agriculturalists ran in the old world, is that after, you know, with intensive, intensive farming, you begin extracting all the nitrogen and all the minerals from the soil, and you can render the land barren, of course, after a while, after a ser series of years. So the method for regenerating the soil was a method otherwise known as the slash and burn, slash and burn agriculture. In other words, they will slash uh, a section of the forest that will let the vegetation there to dry and wither for several weeks. Um, and what they learn is that all of the nutrients of the soil are contained in the vegetation, in the leaves, for example. So by burning the vegetation, they, will, they were able to transfer the minerals back into the soil, in other words. So they will farm there for about three, maybe five years at max in that section, and then move to another section to proceed with the same slash and burn uh, procedure. So uh, they will do this in a kind of rotation manner in that after 20 years or so, they will return to the original position where, from where they started again. So the original position from where they started, they abandoned that and they allowed the vegetation to grow as they were moving into other sections of the forest and so on. And after 20 years, they will really rotate and begin once again in the original point. And that allowed for the constant regeneration of the soil. Now, uh, the Mayas built a series of city-states. Eventually, those city-states turned into kingdoms. They were governed by kings, kings that were considered gods. And they ran the state with a very large bureaucracy made up of priests. Uh, it is really, again, a theocracy. It's really, again, those are state systems governed or ruled by religious figures. And people had to pay tribute to those figures, to those kings and those priests, in order to keep not only the economy going, but from their perspective, to keep the world going as well, because the kings and the priests were performing all of the rituals for the gods to maintain balance and harmony uh, in the world. Okay, so again, it was a system based on tribute. The peasantry really was the one that was really sustaining uh, the state and sustaining the armies as well. The other Mesoamerican civilization were the Aztecs, uh, and they uh, arrived, like I said, uh, to central Mexico around the 1200s uh, AD, and they settled in the middle of a lake uh, and created a city, and this city was known as Tenochtitlan, and this is going to be the capital of the Aztecs, and from that capital they will extend outward and conquer and subdue a number of minor cities and kingdoms, and they will create a vast land-based empire. Now, the Aztecs build a city on the middle of a lake, and they also conducted farming activities in that, in that small island. Again, let me just show you in just a few seconds, you know, the, the map. But uh, they innovated a particular agricultural system, a farming method, that instead of relying on rain particularly or irrigation systems, you know, made from uh, rivers, uh, they actually build farming uh, systems based on the extraction of water from the lake, from, again, uh, this uh, hydroponic system, as it is called. Uh, this system that they innovated was called the Chinampa, the Chinampa system. 
Okay, let me just uh, show you the city of Tenochtitlan. Again, this is the city in the middle of the lake. As you can see, it was a vast city, very well organized. And they built a series of uh, chinampas or floating gardens, as they were known. Again, the floating gardens, the chinampas, as you can see, those were artificially made. Uh, there were floating gardens, and there they grew corn, beans, and squash, including chilies and, and other products. Uh, so this is an innovation. Again, uh, uh, an agricultural system that was very unique in the world. Uh, when the Spaniards arrived in 1519 and witnessed uh, the city of Tenochtitlan, they were really marble. Again, they really have never seen anything like it. Uh, there's plenty of writings, again, by the Spanish conquistadors like Hernán Cortés and his generals that you can read, uh, where you're going to find, of course, accounts uh, of uh, their initial impressions of the city and their farming methods as well as you can see here and, I, and again they're uh, hydroponic uh, meaning that the idea is that the roots of the plants will move downward into the lake and extract the water and this is how they receive nourishment again so it was a self-sustaining kind of system so to speak uh, of course, uh, the lake needed to be nourished year by year, so therefore the Aztecs perform a series of religious ceremonies to the rain god uh, to bring rain, not necessarily to water their crops, but to you know, nourish the lake, you know, because the lake was the source uh, of nourishment for their gardens or their chinampas. Okay? Now, I must say that there was a certain impact that all of the agricultural economic system that I just mentioned so far had on the environment. It is true that back during this time, the impact in the environment by human beings was, was minimum compared to the kind of impact that today modern societies with our industrialized economies are having on the environment. I mean, there is really, again, a, a, a a big jump from the pre-modern era to today. Uh, we do uh, impact the environment in more significant ways in, in terms of pollution, what is called industrial pollution, for example, uh, CO2 emissions into the atmosphere and so on, all of that, uh, indeed. Uh, but during this time, uh, this is not to say that humans did not impact the environment, they did, and they did so in very limited ways uh, particularly in the system of agriculture, uh, there is, of course, soil depletion. Uh, intensive agriculture requires farming intensively, and despite the fact that there was fertilizing methods employed in the old world by the use of uh, cattle, fertilizer, and so on, uh, they're still, again, running into a number of problems as they're extracting the nitrogen out of the soil. And that, of course, creates the crisis of land, uh, rendering the land barren, of course. The nitrogen is very important that it has to be recycled back into the soil. Uh, and so back then there was no way or no efficient, uh, effective way to do so. We have also the problem of deforestation. The fact is that uh, people were uh, cutting down forest in order to use the wood for fuel because wood was the main source of, uh, of fuel that was used for cooking, for smelting iron, uh, copper, uh, for uh, cooking or, you know, taking a, a hot bath, etc. You know, if you require uh, fuel, you have to use food, uh, wood. So that required decimating forest and that happened, of course, extensively in uh, parts of Europe, like Central Europe, parts of Germany, in England as well. Uh, that also happened in China. Uh, and also uh, that happened in a more intensive way in Mesoamerica among the Mayas. As I explained, they built their civilization um, in a rainforest. And as they continue cutting down forests in order to make more room for agriculture, which led to population increase, 
that also led to the construction of massive temples and pyramid sites. Uh, they built over 50 kingdoms, and those 50 kingdoms built uh, thousands of different pyramids and temples. Uh, it is estimated that as a whole, we're looking at about 29,000 structures that they build uh, as a whole uh, uh, with recent uh, uh, technologies. We're now uh, discovering that that number can even uh, be higher than that. So uh, the construction of those pyramids require uh, a certain type of cement. Uh, they call it stucco. Um, and the stucco was made from limestone. Again, they, the Mayas gathered limestone and they burned the limestone in order to pulverize it. And that powdered limestone was used to glue the rocks of the pyramids. And so uh, what that meant is that they required massive amounts, again, of fuel, in this case wood, in order to smelt or to pulverize the limestone in order to build all their pyramids. And that led to the decimation of the entire rainforest of Central America by the Maya. So uh, this is really a case of human environmental impact that led to the collapse of the Maya civilization in the year 900 AD. Uh, most of the city-states, they built over 50. The vast majority of those, uh, those city-states uh, were abandoned on a massive scale by the year 900 AD, and uh, only a, a handful of them continue thriving in the northern part of the Maya world in what is today uh, the Yucatan Peninsula, the northern part of the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, the rest, all the other uh, kingdoms or city-states were totally abandoned because life was rendered uh, uninhabitable, so to speak, uh, the uh, decimation of the rainforest uh, uh, led to the uh, ecological imbalance of the region, which also led to a climate change as well, prolonged periods of drought. So it was very difficult to continue growing crops when there were droughts and continuing for year after year, decade after decade. So again, those large populated urban centers had to be abandoned in mass again. So again, uh, in the pre-modern era, there, there were certain instances of uh, ecological imbalances, uh, high deforestation, and eventually the collapse of a civilization by those economic systems. Uh, so, you know, keep that in mind because uh, as this course is going to be moving along, the timeline moving into the modern era with the rise of industry, for example, and the rise of fossil fuels and so on, uh, with the Industrial Revolution in the 1700s, moving into coal, for example, uh, and so on, and oil, uh, this is going to uh, present a different, of course, scenario for the environment as well. Okay. Now we're moving into part two, um, and uh, part two is going to look at social organization. Now we covered quite extensively economic systems, the way human societies sustain themselves uh, in the pre-modern world. Now we're going to look at society, human societies in different parts of the world and how they were organized because human societies in the pre-modern world were organized very, very differently from the way uh, modern societies came to be organized, even today. I mean, when we look at modern societies today, uh, most uh, human societies in the world that entered the modern era are organized around some form of capitalist uh, or form of social organization. The way we come together and form a community, to form a society, how we socialize with each other, how do, how do we relate to one another, and how do we, uh, how we accomplish also what needs to be done in society, how we get things done, is through some form of capitalist relationship, and that is through the payment of wages, that is to say. Okay? So it's a wage system of 
social relationships, that is to say. You know, we socialize with one another because we are hiring one another to do certain work, certain tasks, uh, certain operations, and this is how we get things done, in other words. Okay? It's a capitalist uh, society. We live in a capitalist society. Now, before the 1500s, uh, capitalism didn't exist anywhere in the world. So people did not come together, form communities, and, and related to one another to get things done by the payment of wages or salaries. Okay? In the pre-modern world, there were two different kinds of ways that people were forming their own communities and societies. Okay, how they were organizing and that how they were getting things done as well. Okay, and those two different systems uh, are called one is called kinship, and the other one is called clientage. Clientage also is another form for uh, feudalism as well. But I will explain uh, very thoroughly what clientage is once we get into that section. Let's start with kinship. And this was the most prevalent uh, form of social organization uh, that existed prior to the 1500s in many, many parts of the world, uh, particularly in parts like Asia, for example, uh, the Middle East, uh, Africa, and the Americas. So what is kinship? All right, so kinship is a word that denotes any group in which the members see themselves as members of an extended family. Okay, so this is really an extended family. That is kinship, meaning that those that lived in communities, villages, in certain towns, and so on, under a kinship form of organization, those societies saw themselves as an extended family, that they were related to one another in familial connections, that they were part of this family because they shared a common past, uh, a common history, uh, mainly common ancestors, and the way that people belong to such king groups is by first and foremost, being born into it. So by being born into a king group, I mean, you're automatically part of that extended family network. Uh, another way you could also belong to a king group is by through marriage. If you marry a person within a king group and you move there, then you'll, be, you'll become part of that group as well. Okay, uh, You become a, a, a de facto member of the king group. Uh, there were other methods by which one could, could also become part of a king group, and that is through initiation or adoption. Okay, you can be initiated into a group, or you can be adopted. If you're adopted, uh, you're accepted you know, from the outside, and uh, your descendants will just become part of the group uh, as a whole. Again, uh, being initiated means that you uh, moved into a group in order to uh, form part of it because you perhaps bring certain skills. For example, you are a very skilled warrior and you want to join the warrior clan, for example. And if you prove to be very brave in battle, very skilled, you can be initiated into that uh, clan and you become part of the group as well. Okay, so uh, this is a very, very common form of social organization that is really very primordial. This really goes back since the very, very be beginning of human societies. In other words, human societies uh, were formed in the distant past, uh, going back to, let's say, uh, the Paleolithic age. We're talking about you know tens of thousands of years ago uh, by people coming together as uh, members of a family, that is to say. So the family was, uh, since the very beginning of human society, is the basis of the entire society and continued to, to be so um, even up to the 14 and 1500s. It's the most prevalent way 
that people live together with other human beings. Again, that they socialize with them, they relate to them, and they accomplish things because they're members of a family. And they have certain obligations. And when you are part of a king group, you have certain obligations that you have to meet. Uh, everybody is obligated, in other words, to help each other. Okay. So whenever you need, for example, assistance in, let's say, you're getting married, you need to build your hut, etc., uh, you call upon your family members, your relatives, to assist you in building that hut. Okay. Uh, whenever they need you, you must also go and help them as well in whatever they request. Uh, you know, it might be building a, a, a house, might be building a road, uh, a bridge etc. Something that the community needs. Again, the people must participate because the idea is that everybody is part of this network of, uh, of a single group, a single family, so therefore they have to cooperate with each other because of those familial obligations. Um, work uh, within a king group was also performed communally, that is to say, uh, uh, meaning that uh, people were not necessarily acting out as individuals within the group. Uh, you're a member of this family, so therefore every type of activity that is called work, whether it's farming or fishing, for example, uh, hunting, um, any type of activity, uh, has to be conducted in group. Again, it's uh, group formations or group work. You go with your relatives to work the land, you know, you work with your relatives to go hunt a deer, etc. And so on. Again, so it's, 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 it's a more of a communitarian uh, uh, enterprise. The entire community see itself as, a, as an enterprise as well. Uh, and there is very clearly uh, elders that are the heads of the group. They are the uh, patriarchs or the matriarchs, the father figures or the mother figures, they might might be uh, the grandparents or the parents, and they are indeed in charge of the family at large. They're making the most important decisions, and people must pay homage to them, obey them, because they know better. Again, so there is a very clear hierarchical organization within the king group in which, in which one must obey their betters, their elders, and also their ancestors as well. The idea of ancestor worship is very, very present uh, in kinship organization. So uh, this is really the most prevalent way that human societies were organized and how they functioned uh, in the pre-modern era. And this is critical to understand because with the coming of modernity, we're going to see significant changes taking place in the world, you know, with uh, this idea of individualism, you know, as uh, people are becoming more and more centered on the self, on the individual, operating as individual human beings, making decisions for their own. And this is going to uh, be a force of change, particularly a force for change for uh, traditional societies that organize around king, kinship. Okay, so we're going to be looking at struggles between individual individualism, those values that modernity brought about, and of course the most traditional forms of kinship. Let's start with Asia, and again, we're not going to look at the entire region. We're just going to focus uh, here on uh, the most. Uh, significant civilizations that will be relevant in our discussion uh, later on in the semester. All right, so let's start with China. And China, since the very beginning of Chinese civilization, and even before the rise of Chinese civilization, around 3000 uh, 3, BC, uh, the people that inhabited this region that were moving into those river systems I discussed in uh, the first session and the Yangtze River, the Yellow River, to establish a series of farms and develop the agricultural revolution, those were actually king groups. 
again, those were actually uh, nested communities of people that uh, were connected with each other in those familial connections that I just explained. And they centered on different parts of the river. They built irrigation networks. And through that, they started really building the very first uh, communities, eventually the city-states, and overall, we're going to see the emergence, of course, of Chinese, Chinese civilization down the line. So kinship stood at the very center of Chinese society since the very, very beginning. Now, over time, as those communities were growing and expanding, the patriarchs, as I mentioned, or you know, in this case, were the father figures who were the elder, the elders in charge of those groups. They acquire more and more prominence, more and more power, and what we see is the emergence of lineages. Again, those were actually uh, very powerful, wealthy families. When that's what a lineage is. So what a lineage is, is one particular family that claims direct lineal descent to the founding ancestors of the group. So therefore, they, because of their ancestry, uh, they claim more power and more access to resources than all the other families within the group. Okay? And they become an aristocracy of sorts in China, those lineages and those families, that is to say. So what we see is the emergence of aristocratic lineages across China. Those are patriarchs that control certain portions of the territory. They're in control of their family network uh, made up of peasants, and the peasants might must, must pay homage and tribute to their lineage leaders because those are the patriarchs. And those are inherited, of course, positions, uh, inherited positions that are passed on from father to son, again, in successive generations. So, at the same time, however, that we see the emergence of the, those aristocratic lineages that are becoming very powerful in different regions of China, we see also the emergence of the state. We see the emergence of a monarchy. A monarchy that is uh, trying to govern the entire region, make decisions for everybody else, but yet uh, there's going to be a struggle between the regional or territorial patriarchs and the state. Okay, the state initially in China was not totally centralized; it was not in total control of China. It was not supreme, that is to say, it was there, it was making decisions, particularly decisions that uh, regarded, for example, issues of warfare to be important, the defense of communities, and so on. But the patriarchs at the local level were still very, very dominant. And there's going to be a struggle across and down through the centuries, across Chinese history. Um, we're going to see a struggle between the local patriarchs and the state. Eventually, those territorial patriarchs uh, are going to develop their own semi-autonomous kingdoms. So although China was governed by a single monarch uh, that was supposed to unify all of the regions of China in the very beginning, again, kinship and identity was very important for people, and people identified with their clan, identified with their family in a particular region, and they obeyed their local patriarch. And those patriarchs were able to build a series of petty, uh, semi-autonomous kingdoms that competed with the state for power. So there, there is a struggle, again, in Chinese history between the local clans and the state for dominance, okay? Eventually, because we find a period of disunity um, in China, by the 6th century BC, what we see is the total disintegration of the monarchy. The monarchy is disintegrating. Uh, 
uh, as a result of losing power and the kingdoms becoming more and more entrenched in their own regions, claiming power as well. And the collapse of the monarchy occurs around the 6th century. And now uh, those different kingdoms uh, are at war with one another. They're now trying to compete with each other for dominance. And China entered this period of the warring states again from 475 to 221 BC. You can see in this map those uh, regional clans, as they were called. Once again, uh, kinship identif identification was central uh, in Chinese society. So this is important because throughout China's history, kinship identification was central in the way people organized themselves. In here we see the clear division and separation of Chinese society along uh, lines based on lineage in this case, that people belong to different clans that were governed by different lineage groups or families and so on. And uh, there was a period of disunity, as you can see, and of course, chaos and warfare as well. Okay, this is a very tumultuous period uh, uh, of Chinese civilization. But once again, the idea is that the clans were at war with one another. Again, this is central to our understanding of kinship in Chinese society. Eventually, one of those regional clans, the Qin, as they were called, uh, that kingdom, is going to emerge triumphant in subduing, conquering all the other states and unifying them and bringing them together under the rule of a single emperor. So what we see is the creation of imperial China. And the person that is credited uh, for conquering all of the kingdoms of China and bringing them into a single state was uh, Shi Wan Di. You know, his name was Shi Wan Di. He becomes the very first emperor uh, of China. He comes from this Qing clan, once again, that emerges uh, triumphant. And this is, you know, one of the reasons, or the principal reason, I should say, why China uh, acquired the name that it has today from the Qing, again, clan that was, again, the unifying force uh, of that region. So we see after 221 BC, now the emergence of imperial China. Uh, it is, of course, dominated by a particular lineage, the Qing, of course, dynasty. Uh, but after the Qing, we're going to see another dynasties ruling over China. Those were different lineage groups, different families, once again, that came into China and governed uh, uh, the empire, because now we're talking about, again, China as an empire, okay? So the emperor at this time is really regarded as the supreme patriarch. Once again, so all over China, the idea is that the, the emperor himself is a patriarch. He is like the father of this entire king group, that China as a whole is really an extended family, and the emperor is really the patriarch, the father figure of the family, that is to say. However, it was not that easy to form uh, the empire due to the fact that there's still a lot of you know, attachment and loyalty on a regional level to the lineage families that rule each territory. And what Shi Wan Di and future dynasties do is that they attempt to incorporate, at least at first, those lineage groups into the imperial administration. Of course, to govern and administer the empire, you needed bureaucrats. Okay, So what we see is the emergence of a bureaucracy, a very large bureaucracy. Okay, And uh, in order to obtain a post within the bureaucracy, uh, initially, the idea is that, well, if you are uh, a member of the local aristocracies, then just by default, you might earn a post within the admi administration. This was done to negotiate uh, with the local leaders, 
uh, of the different king groups or lineages uh, scattered across uh, uh, China and to incorporate them into the state, of course. However, as time progressed, uh, we're going to see other dynasties coming into uh, the imperial power of China, like the Han Dynasty, uh, that comes in uh, just after the Qing Dynasty, and is going to rule China all the way to the 200s AD, for about four centuries or so, they ruled China. And what we're going to see is the Han Dynasty trying to curtail the power of the local aristocracies. And the way the Han Dynasty and subsequent dynasties attempted to do this, and they were quite successful, by the way, is by creating an imperial academy to train the bureaucrats that will serve in the state. To train them and school them and make them, through that education, be more faithful to the emperor and to the state other than being faithful and subservient to their local region. That was the idea. So this is an imperial academy that is going to train now people, people that will be accepted not only from the aristocracy of every region, but they're going to be accepted virtually from all strata of society. So this is a system based on merit. It is called a meritocracy. Okay, a meritocracy. That if you have merit, if you undergo years and years, about 12 years of study, studying the Chinese classics and philosophy, writing and so on, and after that you pass uh, some examinations, then you can graduate from the academy and you can be awarded a post within the administration. This bureaucracy will become central in the development of China because, again, uh, we're going to see the emergence of a scholarly gentry. This is, you know, uh, a group of people, again, those were scholars that were graduated from the academy. They're coming from all regions of China and they're not necessarily aristocrats, so they don't have to pay favors to the local arist uh, aristocratic patriarchs anymore. They are faithful to the state, they're faithful to the emperor, and they're going to be a power in their own right. You know, in China, they were known as the mandarins, for example, the mandarins, the scholarly gentry. And it was a very rigorous examination system that they needed to, to, to pass in order to obtain a job within the, the imperial uh, government. And in this way, slowly but surely, the power of the local clans was limited. They started losing control of uh, exercising significant influence and power in the administration. And by 900 AD, the struggle between the state and the local clans again, comes to an end, so to speak, when the state wins out in this conflict. Now, the mandarins who graduate from the academy are uh, scholars that are coming from all strata of society and they don't really have to pay any favors to the local, uh, to the local clans anymore. However, on a more lo local level, uh, even after 900 AD, on a more local level, at the more community level, Chinese society continues to be organized around this idea of kinship. They have their elders, they uh, obey their elders, but now uh, there is an empire and the emperor who is considered to be a patriarch, by the way, in China as a whole is considered to be an extended family. Again, that idea of kinship persisted down to the centuries after 900 AD, even again, as we entered the early modern period and the modern era as well after 1500, okay? Now, the other region I want to discuss here uh, of Asia is India. India, again, was also a region uh, divided along uh, kin kin uh, kinship organization and 
what we see is India being organized uh, in a way that we see, for example, uh, the or, uh, creation of lineages. You know, Indian society will be divided along different lineage groups. Uh, those are king groups, by the way. Uh, in, in a kind of hierarchical fashion, uh, in a way that each lineage group is going to perform a certain task or certain occupation within the society. Uh, this type of hierarchy was known as the caste system. Again, so it's also a kinship-based form of social organization. This goes back to the Aryan invasion of India around 2000 BC. We see Indo-Europeans, otherwise known as the Aryans, invading India. Uh, and as they invaded India from the north, they encountered, as you can see in this map, uh, uh, indigenous societies there that were dark skin. The indigenous societies were known as the Dravidians, whereas the Aryans are more, again, light skinned. They're coming, again, from, from parts of Europe, present day Ukraine, for example. Uh, the Aryans were a society of warriors and priests. And as they came in into India and conquered India and subdued the local population, they created a hierarchy uh, in order to divide the population, you know, in, in a way that uh, the warriors and the priests were, will be positioned at the very top of the hierarchy and the more indigenous population will be positioned uh, on the bottom of the hierarchy, performing more uh, menial uh, uh, jobs and occupations, uh, and also to be subservient to the upper uh, overlords, you know, occupying the, the upper echelons of society. Again, so uh, they created a hierarchy based on kinship and also on occupation, and in doing so, they created four castes, uh, four uh, subdivisions, so to speak, in society. They were known as the four Barnas. Uh, Barna is a word that in Sanskrit, the language of the Aryans, uh, meant colors, the four colors as they're known. And as we can see, the Aryans who were uh, priests and warriors stood at the very top. The Brahmins, the priests, uh, are at the very top of society, closer, closest to the gods. And then the Kshatriyas, the warriors, also the administrators of the state, also are Aryans as well, carrying very, very important functions in society, again, like religious functions and warfare. Again, now the lower two castes, for example, the Vaishya in this case, which were the merchants, artisans, and peasants, uh, were mixed in so many ways. You know, we will find there, some of them were Aryans, some of them were Dravidians, some of them were actually, again, a mix of both. They also carry very important functions. They were known as the producers. But at the very bottom society, the Shudras, uh, which were really just the Dravidian population, period, uh, the indigenous population of India, they were to be the servants and also the slaves. And of course, uh, outside of the Shudras, there were other groups of people like the Dalits, the untouchables. Those were not even part of the caste system. They were outsiders or outcasts. Uh, that perform the most unclean uh, type of job in society, you know, like um, like cremating the dead, for example, or the you know the butchers of, of animals and so on. Again, so this is a hierarchical form of organization based on lineage, meaning that each caste was supposed to be a king group, meaning that if you are born into, uh, let's say, uh, a priestly caste of Ramins. Uh, is because that is your family. You know, all Brahmins are part of your lineage group. You go back in time to the very first Brahmin that ever lived, in other words, okay? You have a common ancestor in this case. Uh, the same with the warriors, the Vaishyas, and the Shudras. And it was a very rigid social hierarchy that prohibited intermarriage be or, uh, between the castes. So it was prohibited. If you were born, let's say, a Shudra, to marry anybody outside of your caste, you have to stay within your caste. Again, um, uh, the same with the, all the other castes as well. 
Again, so it's a very rigid social hierarchy. There's no social mobility. You cannot move in the hierarchy upward and so on. So uh, your birth determines who you're going to be in society in this case. And there were, of course, very also rigid caste uh, prescriptions and regulations in terms of who you can spend time with and socialize. Uh, uh, the dietary, for example, regulations, the kind of foods that each caste was supposed to eat as well, who you can marry and so on. All of that were very, very strict uh, prescriptions as well. So this is another, again, uh, civilization that used kinship as the basis of, uh, of society. Another region was the Middle East in the Arabian Peninsula. We're also going to look at kinship organization. In this case, it's a more tribal organization. Uh, there are two dominant tribal groups in the Ar Arabian Peninsula that go back in time, even prior to the time of the emergence of Islam, for example. Uh, the Katani and the Adnan, for example. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the Adnan occupied the northern portion of the peninsula, the Katani, the southern portion. And uh, those groups also uh, claimed uh, ancestry going back to certain common ancestors. They saw themselves distinct and different because of their line of descent, in other words. Okay. Now, they, for the most part, prior to the emergence of urban centers uh, or cities in the Arabian Peninsula, those tribal groups were pastoralists or herders. You know, they herded sheep and cattle. This is how they uh, conducted their, uh, their economic activities. And as a result of that, their main function uh, in, within the societies to carry out warfare. Again, those were actually warrior societies you know, due to the fact that in many cases they were competing over territories. They were, in many cases, uh, raiding caravans of merchants or they were raiding, again, certain settlements for you know, products and so on. So war was central to their society. And here what we find is that because they're a tribal group in which they saw themselves as members of a single family sharing common ancestors and they also pay homage to their patriarchs, we see a certain code uh, that they were governed by. And, you know, it's called tribal humanism. Again, it is a kind of moral code or certain code of behavior and manners that they have to follow in order to keep the tribe together. And what that meant is that they were certain uh, oaths of loyalty, for example, that they need, needed to swear to one another, particularly to their elders and patriarchs. They needed to be very faithful. Uh, they needed to be, you know, very brave in, 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 in warfare and also protect the tribe at all costs. You know, they have those type of tribal codes, otherwise known as tribal humanism. The most important unit that needed to be protected was the tribal group, okay, o above all else, again. So, again, they were very, very, very strict in that regard. And there were a series of initiations, again, that they needed to conduct in order to be initiated into the group and to prove loyalty and bravery, allegiance, and all of that, again. The tribal chiefs, the patriarchs, in this case, the heads of those tribes, were seen as the father figures that were protecting the community and the lineage group, as I said, and in, that entailed, of course, waging war against other tribal groups. So there's a lot of uh, inter-regional tribal conflicts uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, going back again, prior to the emergence of Islam, prior to the 600s uh, AD. Now, uh, at some point, we're going to see the emergence of urban centers uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, like Mecca and Medina, where some of those centers uh, that flourished as a result of the network of trade that occurred between uh, Africa, particularly Egypt, and the Indian Ocean. Uh, the Arabian Peninsula stood in the middle, so to speak, of this trading network. And so in the Red Sea, we're going to see the emergence of those nexus points, Mecca and Medina, uh, in which merchants 
are now dominating, of course, more and more the societies uh, in uh, in those urban centers. Again, still, uh, the tribal groups live outside the urban centers, but those urban centers are growing in, in prominence, in wealth, in power, and they're, they're going to be fundamental in the uh, creation of Islam, as we'll see, particularly when we move into session three with the rise of Islam, for, of course. Uh, so, again, we see more and more occupational groups in those urban centers. We have merchants, merchant princes are dominating there. We have artisans, we have farmers. Uh, we also have urban dwellers, of course, that are interacting with the tribal groups outside. Uh, the urban dwellers engage occasionally in trade with the tribal groups. Uh, they trade uh, manufactured goods or uh, exotic products that arrive from uh, from without uh, for animals, for example. And again, there's a symbiotic alliance, so to speak, between those two. But at times there is, of course, conflict and warfare. But over time, Mecca and Medina will become the centers from which a new faith is going to emerge uh, around the 6th 30s, uh, 632 AD, we're going to see the emergence of Islam there, uh, a new faith that is going to spread like wildfire across the peninsula, and those centers uh, will forge the very first state systems that are going to uh, unify all of those tribal groups, so to speak, together under uh, the influence, under the uh, the force of Islam again. So. Uh, tribal identity will continue to be important, but now as those tribal groups are converted to Islam, they're going to be slowly but surely acquiring a new identity that will coexist with their tribal identity, and that is a religious identity, the, religious, uh, the religion of Islam. Uh, uh, so kinship will continue to be important uh, in the Middle East. Tribal identity will continue to be important, but now there is an added force that is also coming into into play and you know those tribal groups will adhere to Islam and at times they will divide themselves over matters of doctrine and so tribal warfare will continue uh, even in the age of Islam due to the, again this very strong kinship tribal uh, identification uh, in that region. Now the other region I want to talk about is uh, Africa. Okay. Uh, Africa is another region where we find kinship to be central. And here, uh, we're just going to focus on one region, and that is the Kingdom of the Congo, as you can see here in this map in the west uh, central uh, part of Africa in the west coast. Uh, there was a massive kingdom uh, which the Portuguese encountered as they arrived there in the 1400s AD. And there would be significant interactions between the Kingdom of the Congo and, and Portugal. Uh, as we move into the 1500s and beyond, and particularly when we look at the slave trade, for example. Okay, so it is in the Kingdom of the Congo where we find also kinship organ organization, a highly structured lineage organization. What we find is a series of tribal groups all connected with each other through a system of alliances. The tribal groups see themselves related to one another through common ancestors. So there is one line of descent, one family that claims a line of descent going back to the founding ancestors of the group. And that family nominates uh, a ruler who really serves as a king, the king of the entire tribal organization. And the title for that individual was the Mani Congo. He is indeed the king, uh, he is the war chief, and he is in charge of trade as well, the Mani Congo. Again, it's a lineage uh, organization. Okay. Now, the way the group works is that the Mani Congo, uh, this king, is not absolute. He has to negotiate with the tribal leaders otherwise known as the big man. Now, every time they have to go to war, well, the Mani Congo has to ask the big man for assistance, okay? 
So this is not a totalitarian or absolute, you know, system, uh, but rather is a system of tribal alliances and negotiations. So the Mani Congo uh, must request the assistance, the consent of the tribal leaders, request manpower, resources, and the like. Uh, the same with trade as well. Okay, so in order to carry out those negotiations, those uh, petitions, uh, the Mani Congo has to resort to certain practices, certain uh, strategies such as marriage. In other words, you know, marrying, for example, some of his sons or daughters to the sons of daughters of the tribal leaders. Again, to create those those links, those bonds between them. There's also uh, the strategy of something called gift giving. You know, the conferring of gifts back and forth between the Mani Congo and the tribal leaders also serve to craft policy. And in that way, they uh, understand that the idea is that as, as a family and as patriarchs, they are making decisions uh, as a whole in concert by strengthening their bonds and in and, and proving to be loyal to be faithful to one another through as the system of marriage and gift giving. Okay, so this is another type of kinship society that has a specific type of structure and functioning very distinct from the other ones we have seen, like the one, for example, in the Middle East with the tribal humanism, or the one we saw in India or in China, for example. All right, so the other uh, region we're going to look at here is the Americas and Specifically, we're going to look at the Mayas of Mesoamerica. So, the Mayas of Mesoamerica uh, also had lineage organization. Now, uh, I mentioned that in the year 900 AD, most of the city-states you know, in the uh, Maya region collapsed. And there were just a handful that survived. That's true. Most Mayas left the cities, uh, their temples, and so on, and they went to live in different parts of the territory of the Yucatan Peninsula. And what we see is the uh, division of the Maya world into a series of lineages. Again, so lineage organization. People that have different associations, identifications with different families, that is to say. Families that go back to the beginning of time to mythical eras, you know, the beginning of creation and so on and so forth. So the Mayas are now divided geographically. Again, uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula, they're governed by different chiefs and they lived in something called a chiefdom. Okay, those geographical chiefdoms in the Maya language are called Kushkabal. A Kushkabal is a geographical chiefdom. There's a chief whose family, again, has a sacred line of descent, so to speak, again, to gods or mythical ancestors. And they're not necessarily kings. They're seen as chiefs. And they are considered the patriarch, the father of all the people that live within their territorial domain. And uh, they see themselves as members of a single family group. That is to say, again, so those are the uh, lineages, so to speak, uh, the geographical chiefdoms scattered across the Yucatan Peninsula. This is again what Hernán Cortés uh, and other Spaniards who arrived uh, into the Maya world after Columbus, this is what they encounter. They encounter about 16 different of those geographical uh, chiefdoms or Cushcabals governed by a Halachwinik. He was the lineage chief. Once again, the, the lineage chief was called the Halachwinik. He was the religious leader. He was also the military chief. Uh, of the group, and he also was in charge of civil power, enforcing civil law, you know, the moral codes that people needed to, to follow, and so on. His position was hereditary, passed on to the eldest son. This, this is called primogenitor. Primogenitor means that, again, the title of chief is hereditary, and is passed on from father to son in successive generations. Now, Every territory contained a series of villages, and what the chief did was to nominate members of his family to be really the chief of every single village. They were known as the Batab, 
the Batab, where the noble village chief, that was awarded a post, a position, by the Halachwinik to lead a village. He is the village leader. He is governing the village on behalf of the Halachwinik. He's there collecting tribute from the peasant population. He sent part of the tribute to the Halachwinik. He keeps part of that tribute to himself, of course. Uh, now, every village really operated as a single community, as a corporate community, so to speak. Every village in every region, again, was considered to be a corporate community, otherwise known as the Kach. Again, so that, what that meant is that if you live in a village in the Yucatan at the time of the contact with the Europeans, uh, you see yourself as connected to the members of your village in direct line of descent. They're really, again, extended family members that share the same last name. So they're, every village is organized by different last names, in other words, or patronym, as it is called. It's a patronym group. And so you live in a village because you all share the same last name, okay? And what it means, corporate community, is that the land that the village holds is owned in common. Okay, It's owned in common. And everybody is really operating as a single entity. That's what a corporate community is. That Again, there's no individualism. Again, it's everybody's pretty much operating as a group. Again, uh, in, within group identity and, and group economic activity as well. All right. So... Now, there is yet another form of social organization that existed prior to uh, the modern era, and that is clientage, as I explained uh, in the beginning of, uh, of this section. Uh, besides kinship, uh, in the pre-modern world, there were some regions of the world, particularly Europe and some African regions, that actually operated under a quite different type of system of social uh, of social organization, and this is known as clientage. This is also known as feudalism as well. What clientage or feudalism is, is again, a system by which people come together uh, to form a community, not necessarily because they see themselves connected to the members of the community in familial links. You know, they don't see themselves, again, as members of this extended family network, like a tribe, for example, a clan or lineage group. They're coming together because they're really living under the rule of a strong man. It can be an overlord, it can be a military chief, it can be uh, a landlord, it can be a prince or a king, and they're there in order to receive protection protection from the strong man, in other words, that they're there to serve this overlord in every way possible. And in return, uh, the overlord protects them. You know, that is like a very, very practical type of uh, relationship. Uh, that kind of relationship uh, is known as a patron-client relation. Patron-client relation. In this case, the overlord, the king, the prince, the landlord, the military chief, etc., who is in charge of a domain, it can be a large territory or, or, or so, is like the person that is in charge of the armed forces, of the armed forces. That person has a personal army, that person has resources, uh, and he uses that to protect a population, okay, to protect a population. And so, in return, the population must pay for that protection, must pay for that protection. Not in terms of money, this is not really a monetary exchange or monetary relationship, but what was of value, again, in the pre-modern world, was labor, okay? So people moving into this system of clientage 
whether in Europe or in parts of Africa, for example, were very conscious that the only thing that they could actually offer, you know, of value to a strong man for protection and so on, was their labor. So what that meant is that uh, people in this type of relationship needed to pay tribute to the landlord, prince, and so on, in terms of, let's say, if you're growing crops, well, at the end of the year, part of your harvest, 15%, 20%, 30%, will have to be given to the overlord. Again, as payment. There's also tribute paid in labor. Sometimes the overlord requires you to work on his land and grow crops in his own domain as well. And so you have to spend maybe a day, maybe two days out of the week laboring in the land of the overlord as well. So tribute was paid with products, whether those, those were uh, agricultural products, for example, like crops you were growing, but also other things. Now, if you were a fish, uh, fisherman, if you were fishing, then you have to also share part of your product you know, as a form of tribute. If you're a herder, you're herding animals, well, you have to give some of the animals, again, as a form of tribute to the overlord for the protection that you're receiving, uh, and so on. Again, if you're collecting wood, if you're making cheese, if you're making wine, you know, everything or anything that you're producing, a certain percentage of that product must be given uh, to your lord protector. You know, those were the feudal lords or lord protectors. He's the patron. He's protecting you, and you're the client. You know, the the, the peasant. You know, paying this, that tribute, uh, the producer, and so on, uh, is the client. You know, paying for that protection. That is to say, that is the kind of relationship. So once again, uh, the feudal lord is not seen necessarily as a patriarch. He's not really related to the people in those familial connections. Again, so there's no network of kinship ties within a feudal society. Okay, That didn't mean that there were no extended families within uh, those, uh, those societies. Of course, there were, of course, families, but uh, those families were very independent and separated from the rest of the population that as a whole all the people that lived under the rule of a feudal lord again they're coming from many different regions many different backgrounds and they're relating to one another only through this feudal relationship that they're there because they want the protection of the lord and they're laboring to pay tribute to the lord paying for that protection that is to say okay so how and why that happened? Well, you know, what led to the creation of clientage and feudalism in history is things like, for example, warfare. Okay? Warfare. Uh, when there were king groups in Europe, because there were actually king groups, there were indeed clans and lineages, those lineages, those king groups, were broken up as a result of warfare and other natural catastrophes, such as, let's say, prolonged droughts. So whenever, again, those catastrophes occurred, whether those were human-made, like warfares and invasions and attacks or nature-made, you know, like droughts, uh, those societies disintegrated and members of those societies left the group and they were seeking protection. They were seeking protection from Somebody who had the means to protect them, a strong man, for example, again, somebody that will have, you know, an army, you know, at his disposal and so on. And what they will do is that they will go to that person and they will render themselves, you know, to them and say, you know, I submit myself to you. Uh, we're not relatives. We're not really connected in any way, but I'm willing to become your servant. I'm willing to become a serf or your vassal and so on in order to receive your protection and I'm willing to pay tribute for that. In other, in other words, I, 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 I'm willing to become your client. And there were, of course, you know, ceremonies of initiation and in which the person uh, uh, actually you know, uh, kneeled down and actually bowed to the Lord 
and there was ceremonies of submission actually again and they entered that kind of contract in other words that relationship of patron client you know system the same with droughts you know that actually happened in places like africa as well uh, whenever there was a drought, you know, those uh, king groups, those tribal groups disintegrated and members actually left the tribe, the community, they went to other places and they will have to actually go and find other communities, other chiefs and render themselves to them and, you know, go through similar ceremonies of submission whereby they were simply rendering their labor, they were becoming now uh, serfs servants uh, of another group of another chieftain and they entered into this patron client relationship as well okay now we have uh, run out of time um, we're not going to have the time to look at europe and africa this is not going to take us much uh, to cover in the third session it will probably take us about you know give and take about 10 minutes to cover feudalism in Europe, also feudalism in Ethiopia and in Mozambique uh, rather quickly. And after we do that, we're going to spend the rest of session three by looking at uh, religious worldviews. Again, we're going to see the uh, emergence of major uh, religious systems, worldviews, uh, like in India, Hinduism, Buddhism, in China, Taoism, Confucianism. Uh, we're going to see Islam and Christianity, and in the New World, we're going to look at the Mesoamerican worldview as well. Okay, everything will be explained in great detail when we return in session three. Thank you.